Okay. Everybody sit down. Uh, let's get started. Oh, sorry. Oh, let, let me do this. Uh, Okay, we're still on track. Um, you know, we are following the, um, you know, the plan. Um, something I would like to mention. So uh, you may notice that in the past couple of lectures, I didn't, um, I didn't specify any particular readings. The reason is that I'm kind of like deviating a little bit. You know, well, I mean, quite a bit from anything that you see on the on the textbooks. Okay, so I don't want you to get. I don't want to get you confused in the sense that you think that you will find this exactly written in the textbooks. On the other hand, if you want to look at another explanation of some of this material, just look the material on transfer functions on either the good seller, uh, either good sellers or the uh, Armstrong and Murray textbook, okay? Uh, but you will not find this material in exactly the same way, okay? Uh, okay, so last time what we did is we introduced this idea of transfer function, okay? So essentially a transfer function was an alternate way that you can actually write down the dynamics, the model of a linear time invariant system. Um, and in particular, this is something that relates what happens when you give a, an input of a special form, e to the power st, so essentially an exponential with a potentially a complex um, exponent. And what we found is that the output, you get exactly the same exponential multiplied by some function of s, and that's exactly a transfer function, okay? So what we'll do today is we look at this transfer function. Uh, you will see that there are many, many different ways that you can write these transfer functions. We will look at what are those ways. I mean, this is the same function, okay? So there's just different, ray, different ways of writing it, okay? And we look at why you want to use these different ways and you know, um, what can you do with this, okay? In particular, for example, what we'll do is we will um, look at how you can actually compute the value of this transfer function, g of s, which is a complex number, uh, graphically, okay? Um, you can do it with pages and pages of algebra, or you can do it with MATLAB, uh, but um, you know, and there is a nice way, graphical interpretation of this that actually is useful when either don't, you don't have a few hours to do the calculations, or you don't have MATLAB handy, and you want to understand what this transfer function looks like, okay? Um, then we look at uh, what are the poles, what are the effects on the response, what are zeros of a transfer function, what are the effects on the response, and we look at connections between zeros and uh, derivatives, and also at something that is called no minimum phase zeros, okay? So we look at what all this means. So recapping what we said in the previous lecture. So what we know is that given a, a, a linear time invariant system with a state space model given by these matrices A, B, C, D, we know that if we have some input function U of uh, U of t, that you can compute the output y of t just by computing this integral, um, the, the, this, this function. Actually, here I forgot, um, you know, the d term, right? So this should be this plus d times u of t. Okay. Good. Um, now, what we said last time is, as long as the system is stable. And remember that the condition for the system to be asymptotically stable is that all the eigenvalues of the matrix A have negative real part, meaning that these are all exponentials that eventually go to zero, okay? Then if you apply an input of the form U of t is equal to e to the power st, that is an exponential with a complex, possibly complex exponent, then we know that the steady state output is given by G of s times the same function as the input, right? So G of S times the input. 
where this G of S is defined in this way, okay? And this is what we call the transfer function, okay? So I hope so far so good. Now, when you do the calculations, so you see that this is, uh, you know, you have a bunch of matrices. You have here uh, this function S i minus a, right? So you see that this is clearly a function of S. When you do the calculations, what you will find is that this function is actually something that you can write as the ratio of two polynomials, okay? Um, in general, um, okay, so this would be a proper rational function. By proper, what I mean is that the degree of the numerator is at most the degree of the denominator, okay? What is the degree of the denominator? That's the same as, the, you know, how many roots will, have, will this polynomial have? The same as the number of eigenvalues of A, which is the same as the dimension of A, okay? So the degree of the denominator will be equal to the size of the matrix A, that's the order of the system, okay? The degree of the numerator will be no more than that, okay? So this is what is called the proper rational function, okay? So this is one way uh, of writing this transfer function, just as the ratio of two polynomials. Uh, we can write it as some n of s, which is the numerator, right? Is the, 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 the numerator polynomial over d of s, which is the denominator polynomial, fine, okay? So this is just one way that you can write this thing. There are other forms that are actually convenient, okay? So the first one uh, that I will present, which is not the first one that we will work with, um, this is something that's called the partial fraction expansion. Essentially what you do is the following. You take this denominator, right? You can factorize it, and then you write this sum as the sum of a bunch of fractions, each one of which has one factor of the denominator at the bottom, okay? So essentially, when you compute this sum, you will get this thing back, right? Just by computing the minimum common multiple and the denominator, doing all the calculations and so forth, okay? So this has the form of a bunch of numbers, okay, so a bunch of fractions with S minus the poles, right? So the poles P1, P2, up to Pn are actually the roots of the denominator, okay? I.e., these are the, um, um, the, what is the denominator? The denominator is actually the characteristic polynomial, which is the determinant of Si minus A, okay? The roots of these polynomials are also called the eigenvalues of A, right? So, I mean, all things are connected, okay? These are all different ways of looking at the same thing, okay? Um, these numbers that appear at the top are called the residues. Okay, we will look at some ways of computing those. Okay, questions? So it's just one way, we'll do a few examples. This is just one way of rewriting the same thing, okay? Other ways that you can write the same thing is by factorizing the polynomials at the numerator and denominator, okay? So what you can do is factorize them this way, okay? So as a bunch of the denominator is S minus the first pole times S minus the second pole, blah, blah. And the numerator, what you would have is S minus, what I'm writing here is Z1, Z2, so on and so forth. The Z1, Z2, up to possibly Zn, these are called the zeros of G of S, okay? So these are the roots of the numerator polynomial, okay? And as you can, as you can see, these are the values of S for which the transfer function actually takes value zero, okay? Now, as you can see, this form here and this form here are essentially the same with a difference, right? So in this form, what I'm doing is each one of these factors, I have a coefficient one in front of the first order term, right? So this is S, minus something times S minus something, okay? Okay, so I can collect all terms this way, and then I will have some coefficient that multiplies the whole fraction. I will call it K, this, I will call this the root locus gain, okay? You don't know what the root locus is. This is something that we'll do next week, okay? For now, just 
you know, just take it for granted that this is something that we can call the root locus form, okay? Because this is a form that will make, a, will make it easy for us to use the, this root locus method. Uh, also, this is something that is very useful to compute the value of G of S by hand, and this is what we'll do next, okay? What is the difference with this other form? This other form is something that we call the body form, okay? And as you can imagine, this is exactly the same thing, with the only difference that now I, instead of having one in front of, coefficient one in front of all the S terms, what I have is a one as the constant term. Okay. As you can imagine, I can go from between the two just by multiplying and dividing by some number. So the number that is in front of the fraction in this case is something that we'll call the body gain. Okay. You see that structurally these two forms are exactly the same thing. The only difference is that we want coefficient ones in front of the S's here. We want coefficient one for the constant terms here. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Okay. Okay, so let's do an example, right? So, and um, this example is, let's say that we are given a certain transfer function, okay? Don't ask how we got there, okay? So some, somehow we have a system, somebody did a model or somebody did an experiment and that somebody told us, okay, this system has a transfer function G of S equal two times S plus one over blah, blah, okay? You see that I have a numerator, so I have a polynomial at the numerator, I have a polynomial at the denominator, right? What is the order of the system? Yeah, so the order of the system is the degree of the denominator, okay? You see that the degree of the, of the numerator cannot be more than the degree of the denominator in particular, in this case is one. So how many poles will we have? How many roots of this polynomial? <coughs> we have three poles, how many zeros? One, okay? Now, let's say that what we want to, to do now is we want to see what will be the steady, steady state response to a sinusoid to an input that is a sinusoid, right? So we choose a u of t, just sine of t, okay? What is s in this case? Remember that if I choose s to be a purely imaginary number, then I can think of e to the power j, you know, omega t as one half, you know, between quotes of a sinusoid, right? Because I know that if I apply e to the power j omega t, I will also have to apply e to the power minus j omega t so that I get a real input, okay? So now in this case, essentially this is saying that we are choosing as s equal to j, okay? Okay, so you have s is purely imaginary, it's a frequency, it's a sinusoid of frequency one, okay? And constant amplitude, right? Now, we know that the steady state, um, um, well, uh, let me just write it. So a steady state um, so let me read that, then. sorry. Um, a steady state, what I will have is a sinusoid, right? We have exactly the same form of the input, so a sinusoid of frequency one, okay? with a different phase where the phase is given by the argument or the angle of G of J and a magnitude that is given by the absolute value, the magnitude of G of J. Okay, is this clear? Questions? Remember that um, the steady state is given by G of S times the input, right? When I multiply two complex numbers, what happens to the magnitude? The magnitudes are multiplied, right? So what is the magnitude 
of sine of t, well, it's one, right? So the magnitude of the output, the steady state output will be the magnitude of g of s, okay? What happens to the phase? The phases get added, right? So then what is the phase of sine of t? Well, it's zero. What is the phase of the, of the output? Will be zero plus the phase of the transfer function, okay? So now the problem is that we need to compute g of j, okay? And or in particular, you know, g of j will be a complex number. We can compute its, its magnitude and its phase. Okay, so how do we do that? Okay. Well, what you can do is just go to this function here and substitute j to s and do all the calculations, right? So you will get here, uh, this will be two times j plus one over j cube plus four j squared plus six j plus four, right? Can you do this calculation? Yes, of course, I mean, you can, you know, start run these numbers, a little bit of algebra, probably you have done this many times, you know, maybe even in high school or, you know, like the first year of college, right? However, this is kind of like a, you know, labor intensive and it's not very insightful, right? So you just get the number at the end, you have no idea what, what, what happened in the meantime. Or you can do, go to MATLAB and ask MATLAB to do it. And MATLAB will very, very happily do it for you, okay? But again, you don't understand anything that why you get that particular answer, okay? So what we will do is we look at ways to actually compute this number, this complex number, but using graphical methods, okay? So we can compute it by hand, but without doing a lot of calculations, just doing by drawing a pretty picture, okay? So um, first step is to factorize the, um, you know, this transfer function, okay? We are using this root locus form, okay? Now, just by some, you know, creative guessing or eyeballing, so if you look at this polynomial, uh, you can believe that, for example, there is an, uh, a root of this polynomial is actually minus two, okay? Just look at the coefficients. Yeah. Once you do these things a few times, <laughs> you can guess it. Uh, or again, you can put it to MATLAB and ask MATLAB to find the roots for you, okay? Anyway, the roots are minus two, minus one, plus or minus j, okay? So can, I can write this, um, uh, this polynomial in this way, okay? Now, let's compute the magnitude of this g of s. Remember that when we, when we take the magnitude of, the, of a product of two numbers, okay, so I have two complex numbers, I multiply them, and I want to compute the magnitude of the product, that is the same as taking the magnitude of the first one times the magnitude of the second one, okay? So if I want to compute the magnitude of this whole function, I can just write it as, well, this technically speaking should be a magnitude of two, which is two, okay? Magnitude of two times the magnitude of s plus one over the magnitude of s plus two times the magnitude of s plus one plus j, so on and so forth, okay? Now, graphically, what is magnitude of s minus p? Think of, you are on the complex plane. You have one of these poles, say, you know, this is, let's say this is p, and then you have s. What is the magnitude, what is s minus p on this complex plane? Anybody has an idea? If these were two points on a plane, forget complex numbers. What would be S minus P? If these were two vectors. Anybody? Come on. That would be the S plus P over two, right? So that would be the, the average, the point in the middle. Mm -hmm. right. So just take this, right? So this is S minus P, okay? So what is the magnitude of S minus P? It's just the length of that vector, okay? So 
how do we compute this magnitude of G of S? The magnitude of G of S would be given by two times the magnitude of S plus one, right? S plus one is the distance between the zero at minus one and S, which is J. What is the length of this vector? What is the length of this vector? This is one, this is one, this is? <laughs> Square root of two. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so we had the two, that was the coefficient that multiplied the whole fraction, right? Then we have square root of two, which is the magnitude of this vector. This is the vector S plus one, okay? Divided by the magnitude of this vector. How much is the magnitude of this vector? This is two, this is one, Pythagoras, this is square root of five, right? divided again the magnitude of this vector. How much is the magnitude of this vector? Actually, we can write it, right? So this was square root of two, this is square root of five, this is square root of five, okay? And how much is this vector here? This is the easy one, come on. What is the length of this vector? One. One. Amazing again, right? Okay. So you see that we can write the magnitude of this transfer function evaluated at s equal j as two, the multiplies, square root of two, divided square root of five, divided square root of five, divided one. It's two times square root of two over five. Quick calculation, using just a simple calculator, you don't need MATLAB for this. This is 0 0.56, blah, blah, okay? You get a sense of how I did this calculation? Okay, good. So this is the magnitude. What can you say about the phase or the argument of G of S? Again, when you multiply two numbers, two complex numbers, and you want to compute the angle, the phase of those, of those, the argument of those two numbers, I will use angle, argument, and phase kind of interchangeably, okay? Because they are actually the same, okay? So if I want to compute the phase of this, of, this, um, um, of this product, that is actually given by the phase of A plus the phase of B, okay? So if I want to compute the uh, phase of the transfer function, what I can do is just, okay, is the phase of the coefficient multiplying the whole fraction plus the phase of the numerator minus the phase of the first term and the denominator minus the phase of the second term minus the phase of the third term, okay? What is this angle? That's actually the angle formed by that particular vector with the real axis, okay? So again, let's do it. So what is the phase of the number two? Number two is somewhere here, right? So it will be like a vector that is aligned with the real axis, so the phase is zero, okay? the phase of any positive number is zero. Plus the phase of this vector. What is the phase of this vector? What is this angle? It's 45 degrees. Okay. Minus the phase, the angle of this vector. What is this angle here? I don't know, but this would be the, the angle whose tangent is one over two, right? What is this angle? I don't know, is the angle whose tangent is two over one, okay? So, uh, so this is tangent inverse one half. This is tangent inverse two. Um, and what is the phase of this vector? zero, right? It's a horizontal vector, okay? So what I have here is the phase of G will be given by zero plus 45 degrees minus this arc tangent minus this arc tangent plus zero 
notice that one half is the inverse of two, right? So if you remember your trigonometry, actually the sum of these two angles is uh, pi over two, is uh, 90 degrees, right? So essentially what we get is 45 degrees minus 90 degrees, the end result is negative 45, okay? So what we know is that the, the output, the steady state output to an input of the form u of t of equal to sine of t will be 0 0.5657 at magnitude times the sine of t minus 45 degrees. Lo and behold, we can try it in MATLAB, right? Um, so the gray, the gray sinusoid is actually the input, okay? You see that it's a sinusoid with magnitude one, okay? The output is something that initially is a little bit complicated, but you see that very quickly becomes the sinusoid itself. What is the magnitude of this sinusoid? Amazingly, is exactly the value that we computed, okay? What is the face of this sinusoid? What you will see is that, um, so this is the peak of the input and this is the peak of the output. How much out of phase are there, are they? They're actually out of phase by 45 degrees, okay? So our calculations were actually correct, okay? And as you can see, this is, this is a procedure that, you know, you can kind of do quickly on a piece of paper, right? Um, you don't have to go through complicated calculations or you don't really need MATLAB for doing this. Now, when you're doing, of course, I chose the numbers to be kind of convenient, right? So then all the numbers were, were, were easy, right, to compute. But when you're doing this back of the envelope calculations, you don't need to be precise, okay? What, what you can do is, well, okay, so this vector will be you know, approximately two or approximately 1.5 or whatever. This angle is approximately 30 degrees, so on and so forth. So then you get an approximate result, which is enough for you to understand what's going on. Then once you get precise numbers, then you go to, to MATLAB, okay? But a lot of the things that we will do in this class is exactly to allow you to understand at an intuitive level what is happening, okay? You want precision, you go to MATLAB. Okay, MATLAB will not solve your problems for you. If you need to design a control system, you have to understand, you, have, you need to have an intuition for what is happening so that you can be creative in your design. Okay, so that's why I emphasize all these graphical methods, back of the envelope methods um, that give you a lot of insight and understanding for the precision, you just leave it to the computer and do it in MATLAB, okay? Questions? Exactly, so I generated this plot with MATLAB, okay? So in particular, I, I used a command that is called LSIM, okay? Stands for linear system simulation, whatever, okay? Uh, and as you can see, so the initial condition was at zero. You see that initially the response is not exactly sinusoid, right? But eventually it becomes a sinusoid. And this sinusoid is described exactly by this formula here. Okay, so I know that if I choose as an input a sinusoid at that frequency, one, one radio per second, the output will be another sinusoid with amplitude approximately one half of the input, okay? And phase will be a little bit delayed with respect to the input, okay? Yep. No, no, okay, so whenever you have a linear system, the only equilibrium point for the linear system can only be zero, otherwise it's not linear, okay? So, <laughs> so if you have a no linear system, then what you can do is find the equilibrium points and then linearize around 
that particular equilibrium point, okay? But once you get the linear system, the equilibrium is always zero, okay? I mean, there is no choice, okay? Okay, so given that fact, so the equilibrium point for the linear system will always, always be zero, then a transfer function is a model for a linear system, is exactly the same as having a model, right? Because as we saw last time, given a transfer function, you can construct the ABCD matrices. And given ABCD matrices, you can construct a transfer function. So the two are exactly equivalent, okay? Okay? Now, what I'm trying to do here is, okay, I have a model of a linear system, for example, in the form of a transfer function. Now, okay, so I have this transfer function, which is a, it's a function, is a ratio of two polynomials in S. What does it mean? I have no idea, right? So what I'm trying to do here is to try to understand what will be the behavior of this linear system given the transfer function model. In particular here I'm asking, so if I apply an input to sinusoid with a certain frequency, what will be the output? Okay, we know it will be a sinusoid with the same frequency, but we have different magnitude and different phase, okay? And in this case, I was trying to compute what that magnitude and what that phase would be. Right, so YSS is actually the steady state output, okay? What this, what this function is converging to, right? Initially, this is not a sinusoid, okay? But eventually becomes a sinusoid with that magnitude and that phase, okay? Right. <laughs> How did you do it in the exercises? You can get you can get this thing from from the from a state space model. You can also get it from transfer functions. For some things, for human beings, is easier to do it, or at least for me, it's easier to do it from the transfer function using these kind of like a graphical considerations. Okay. It's the same, it's the, these are all the same things. You just look at different ways to, uh, to compute the same things. Some ways are easier for a human being or at least a normal human, human being uh, to, to, to compute, okay? Okay, so this is a way of giving a transfer function, um, you know, compute this, uh, this steady state response, okay? Um, now what I would like to do is understand a little bit better, bit better the effects of the poles and zero of the transfer function, okay? So this is something that we really, we already looked at in a sense, right? Because we already know that the, um, that the response, for example, the response to initial condition will be a linear combination of exponentials, right? Where the coefficient of the exponential are the uh, eigenvalues of A, right? So we already know that. Let's revisit the same thing from a different angle, okay? So, um, you know, in addition to this, um, you know, like a steady state behavior with, um, with like a sinusoidal input, sometimes what we like to do is apply some other test inputs to see what happens, to see how the system behaves, okay? Uh, typical test inputs include something called like an unit inputs, so unit impulse means, so you have your system, okay? And as an input, you just kick it, okay? Um, you know, when, you, when you're tuning an instrument and you use that thing, right? So I don't know how it's called. Uh, so you just hit it on something, right? And then you have the, the note, like, uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, okay? But essentially the same thing. So you just hit the system and then you excite some motion, okay? And that is the, uh, the impulse response. So, when we say that we want to um, apply uh, an input response, we say we write it as u of t is equal to delta of t, where this delta is actually not a well-defined function, okay? So this is really a mathematical construct uh, such that the integral of delta um, is, is one, okay? For any epsilon greater than zero, okay? In particular, if I'm computing the integral between zero and t of some f of tau d tau, this integral is actually given by f of zero, okay? So just a mathematical construction, okay? 
or you can consider a unistep input where we say that u of t is equal to one for time greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero if you want. Note that this is the same as choosing u of t equal to e to the power zero t, right? e to the power zero is equal to one, okay? You can also do uh, other test inputs where you say u of t is equal to t or u of t is equal to one half t squared or higher order <clears throat> you know, monomials, those are not as commonly used, okay? So typically what you refer to are the unit inputs and the uh, unit step input, okay? Unit step. What is the impulse response? Go back to our formula. Just assume that d is equal to zero, okay? If d is not equal to zero, you just have to add d times u to the output, okay? So, Initial conditions are zero. We are looking at just the force response. The uh, the, the, the response to the response to the, imp, or to the impulse will be given by this integral. Okay. Notice that. Okay. So we have c times e to the power a t minus tau, b times u of tau, which in this case is delta of tau. Remember that when we are computing an integral, where part of the integrand, you have one of these delta functions then the value of the integral is just the integrand computed at zero, okay? So this is why this is the result, okay? Now, does this remind you of anything? I have c times e to the power a t multiplied by something. What is the response to an initial condition? If I set u is equal to zero and I set x at time zero is equal to x naught, what is the response, remember? The response to an initial condition x naught is equal to c times e to the power a t times x naught. See any similarities between this and this? <laughs> exactly the same thing. So. Something that, okay, so these are, these are the things that, you know, this is why I don't like these textbooks, because they don't tell you things, okay? So the impulse response is exactly the same as the response to an initial condition, x naught, x at time zero is equal to b, okay? These are not different things, okay? Now, what is this in general? How do I compute this, this, uh, this uh, matrix exponential? If A is a diagonal, if I have diagonalized this, this matrix, then we have seen that this expression here is actually the sum of a number of terms, right? Uh, you know, in the case of this diagonal, this would be uh, C1, B1 times um, um, E to the power A T, uh, A1 T, um, we call it lambda 1 T right, plus C2, B2, E to the power, lambda 2, T, dot, 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 right, right? So essentially what this is, is a sum of exponentials. If these exponentials, if, these, if the eigenvalues of A, the lambdas, if lambda I is real, then it's just a simple exponential, E to the power, lambda I, T. If lambda I is complex, then there must be a complex conjugate, right? And then what you have, if when you add the two, uh, what you get is this sinusoid with an exponentially changing magnitude, okay? We have seen all of this you know, in the past, okay? What is the step response? Um, we do the calculations as before. Now u of t is just equal to one, okay? You do this calculation, simple algebra in a sense, what you get is the result is um, minus C A inverse B minus blah, blah, you know, all of this, okay? Um, okay, set this state response, if A is stable, this part here will disappear, right? Will go to zero. So the steady state response is just minus C A inverse B, which is actually G of zero. We know that the steady state response when s is equal to zero must be g equal to zero, 
G of zero, yeah. Which one? G of zero, yeah. Uh, remember what is G? G of S is equal to C times S I minus A inverse B, okay? Plus D, but we said that D is equal to zero, okay? Now S, when we apply step input, if we say that U is equal to one, is the same as saying that U is equal to, to E to the power zero T, right? So, um, you know, S in this case will be zero, right? So when you compute this for S equal to zero, then this will become, you know, for S is equal to zero, then this becomes C times minus A inverse B, okay? Which is exactly that, okay? okay. And you can see it again. <laughs> Mathematics must work out, right? So whatever path you follow to get to a result, as long as your calculations are correct, you get the same result, right? So um, we get this result by just looking at, just computing the integral. We get the same result by looking at the transfer function, okay? So this is your steady state, um, you know, output. If your system is a scalar, this is actually minus BC over a, okay, where A is your eigenvalue, okay? So if you compare with uh, what we had, um, you know, um, uh, where I mean, if you collect terms, what you will see is that the response to a step is given by the steady state, which is actually constant, okay, in this case, times one minus e to the power at. Essentially what this means is that the step response is the steady state response, okay, which is you're giving a step as an input, you will get a step as an output with just a different magnitude, right, where the magnitude is given by this number here, okay, minus e to the power at, which is actually the input response, okay, essentially scaled, okay. So in fact, as you see, the input response totally defines the response of a system and if you like the Laplace transform things, um, something that you may want to notice is that the input response is actually the inverse Laplace transform of the transfer function, okay? Transfer function, input response are exactly the same thing, just one is a function of time, the other one is the transform in the Laplace domain, okay? Let's take a break. Um, we'll continue, um, you know, afterwards. Okay, yeah, so somebody made me notice uh, there was a typo here in the, in the, in the slides. Um, here I forgot there should have been a, a inverse in between, okay? Uh, you may want to do these calculations by yourself. Um, not, also not sure about this sign here. Uh, this might be a plus, but we do a calculation and we'll figure out for yourselves, okay? So. Um, Okay, so now if we have a system with a, you know, with a state space model, just a first order system, the matrix A is just a scalar A, matrix B is scalar B, so on and so forth. Transfer function we know is G of S. Uh, just do a calculation would be uh, uh, BC over S plus A, okay? Uh, and I call this BC is actually equal to R, okay? So notice that the residue, if you are thinking, as we said before, the residue, if you're thinking of a diagonal form, diagonalized form, the residue is actually the product of B and C for that particular eigenvalue, okay? The response to a unit inputs, right? We know that will be this R times E to the power AT, okay? By the way, if you're really into Laplace transforms and things like that, what you will see is that this one here is the transform of this, right? So you see that the transfer function is the Laplace transform of the input response, okay? I understand that you're taking Laplace transform in some other class at the same time, okay? So I'm trying to avoid talking too much about Laplace transform because you don't really need to. On the other hand, 
if you are the world expert on Laplace transforms, you know, this will help you understanding all of this material as well, okay? So if we have a higher order uh, system, then we can write the partial fraction expansion in this way. The response on impulse will be, uh, you know, when, when I write a, a system as the sum of a bunch of terms, I can also think of that system as the parallel of a bunch of other systems, each one of which has this particular, one of these particular transfer functions. The output, uh, we, then I can get the output just by summing the individual outputs, right? So then the, 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 the response to an impulse will be of the form R1 times e to the first pole t plus R the second residue times e to the power second pole t, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so, and you know, here, you know, at this point you should have it very clear, right? So the effect of each pole, that is the effect of each eigenvalue of, of A, the two are the same things, is to generate a term in the response, which is an exponential <laughs> with exponent that particular pole, right? If that pole is real, the exponential will be a simple exponential, either decaying to zero if that pole has, is negative, or diverging to infinity if that pole is positive. If that pole is complex, then there must be a comp complex conjugate, and the effect of the pairs is to generate a sinusoid with an amplitude that is exponentially decreasing if the real part of those poles is negative, and exponentially increasing if the real part of those poles is positive, okay? we are saying the same thing over and over again, right? So just by getting to it from slightly different uh, angles, okay? So what we're showing here is actually a, a, like an important, you know, uh, figure, okay? So let's try to build it. So typically what you do is when you have a transfer function, you will draw what is called the pole zero map, okay? What is the pole zero map? The pole zero map is essentially is is the picture of the complex plane where you put little crosses at all the poles and you put little circles at all the zeros, okay? Now, um, what would be, so let's say that you have a pole at this location here. This will generate a term in the response that will look like, what? <laughs> Right, so this would be something that would look like, say, this, okay? If I had another pole that was here, what would that response look like? So the response would be another exponential how do the two differ? Right, so this one will also be decreasing, but will be decreasing much slower, okay? So the time constant is much larger, right? Okay? So the faster you go to the left is, uh, you know, this is a faster decay, okay? Sorry for my handwriting on this thing. Okay? Further you go on the left, the faster it decays. Okay? On the other hand, I can say, well, what if I have a pole that is here? What happens to my response? My impulse response. Okay, so now this will be an exponential that is diverging, right? What about here? This will be another exponential that is now is actually <laughs> diverging much faster. Okay? Uh, what about here? So this would be a constant, exactly. Okay? So here what you have is, is what is called an integrator, right? And you know, here you give some input and you know this this will neither decay, neither diverge. So we stay constant. Excellent. Okay, now, what if I had a pole now that is here? 
the first thing you know is that actually, if there is a pole here, you know that there is, must also be a pole here, okay? There's no way around that, okay? Everything must be symmetric up and down, symmetric with respect to the real axis. Okay, what do you know about, if you have a pole there, you would have a term in the output that will look like So this will be something that will oscillate. What will be the frequency of that oscillation? Will be exactly the imaginary part of that pole, okay? And how fast, how will the magnitude change, the amplitude of this oscillation change? Will change in exactly the same way as this exponential here, but now you will oscillate in, you know, okay, in the middle, right, so in between. So now you will do something like that, okay? What do you think of a pole here? Again, you will oscillate, so it will decay faster, right? And oscillate at the same frequency, okay? What do you think will happen for a pole here? Now you have this diverging exponential, and you have a sinusoid that will oscillate between these bounds. What will you have here? An exponential that is diverging quickly. And again, you have a sinusoid that oscillates between these, these bounds, okay? What do you think will happen here? There will be a sinusoid that is uh, just constant, constant amplitude. Okay, uh, what do you think will happen here? Okay, which of course, remember that everything must be symmetric. What do you think will happen here? So this is again a sinusoid, but the imaginary part is smaller, meaning that the frequency will be smaller. So here will be a sinusoid, but the frequency will be slower, okay? so. The real part of the eigenvalues will give you either faster decay on the left or faster divergence on the right. Okay? Yeah? Which one? Down to the left? Um, would you mean here? It's the same as this. Uh, sorry, so you cannot see it. It's the same as this, right? So, because if I have a pole here, I must also have a pole here, and I also need to look at what is the combined response, right? So I cannot, I cannot have just a complex pole without having its conjugate, okay? Clear? Okay, so, um, You move to the right, the real part gets more positive, faster and faster divergence. Real part gets more negative, faster and faster convergence to zero. The imaginary part goes up, right? What happens? As you are converging or diverging, you are oscillating faster or slower. Okay? Um, what do you think will happen if I actually, so if I move in this direction, is this a faster, ah, sorry, faster oscillation. What do you think will happen if I move in a direction that goes like that? So a little bit more, uh, you know, not as intuitive. What happens if you move along a line starting from the origin? Essentially what you're changing, you're not changing the shape of the response, you're just changing the time scaling. Okay? Maybe useful. Okay? Is this 
drawing clear. Okay, so essentially this summarizes everything that happens that the system is able to do, okay? Each pole, I mean, if you have like 20 poles in your system, okay, each pole will be somewhere in the complex plane. Each pole will generate a term that will look one of these little, um, you know, sinusoid with decaying exponential you know, amplitude and so on and so forth, okay? Clear? Good. Now, what do you think our job as control engineers, control designer will be? Essentially what we need to make sure of is that all of the poles, um, <laughs> uh, let's draw something like that. Do you think that you will want poles to be, you know, uh, to be in this region here? No, that's where things blow up, okay? So this, no, bad, okay? Uh, where do you want them to be? Do you typically, do you say that you want them to be here, kind of? Yeah, so things will go back to your equilibrium, but we'll do, we'll take their time to do so, right? So. Is that great? No, I mean, the thing is not blowing up in your face, but it's not working that great, right? So if your thermostat, you know, takes two weeks to, to, you know, to heat up your room, you're not happy, right? So typically what we would want is to say something that, okay, so this is also bad. We want the response to go back to my equilibrium quickly enough, okay? Now, do you think that a response that is, say, up here is actually good for you? So yeah, you're going to your equilibrium, but you're oscillating a lot. So now you're on your car and your cruise control, you say, okay, so now go to 60, to 100, and then 40, 140, right? So you want that? No, okay? So uh, typically you don't want to have too many oscillations, okay? So then, this is bad, okay? So typically what you would like to have is something that where your response will look something like, um, you know, in this case, the input response will look something like that, okay? So maybe overshoot a little bit, not too much, and then settle, settle quickly to your, to, the, to, the, to your equilibrium, okay? So then everything that we will do in this course is to try to figure out what is a good control design in such a way that even in the case the poles of my system are somewhere all around the place, we bring them back to this region where you have a nice behavior, where your system will converge to the equilibrium quickly without crazy oscillations, okay? That's all there is to it. Well, I mean, that. So that's what we want to do then, how we do it, it's a different story, okay? But you understand why, you know, we are looking at how, what is the effect of all these poles and things, right? So what we want to do is make sure that the poles are where we want them to be, in nice locations. Yeah. This design response takes for every single system or is there like a bandwidth? No, no so, so, um, so I didn't put numbers there, right? So, uh, and, uh, and the numbers, uh, will be different, right? So typically, say, you are designing a control system for a chemical reaction that takes weeks, maybe that equilibrium condition for you, you know, the bandwidth will be, say, a few hours, you know, you're happy with that. If you're controlling a cruise control for a car, maybe a few hertz of a bandwidth is sufficient. If you're controlling an unstable aircraft, maybe you want, you know, a few, you know, uh, like a hundred hertz, right? So specific numbers depend on the specific applications, but what is true in general is that you want the response to be, the real part to be sufficiently negative so that you have quick enough response, right? And also you want the frequency in a sense to be sufficiently small that you don't oscillate too crazy, right? You don't oscillate too much, okay? 
Okay, and you know those numbers depend on the specifics of the applications. Okay. Okay, so now what we have seen is the effect of polls, right? So essentially each poll will give you some component in the response that will look one of these exponential, or of these exponentially decaying exponential, so on and so forth, right? Exponentially decaying sinusoid. Now, what we have not seen is the effect of the zeros on the response. <coughs> and um, as you can imagine, when I'm adding all of these terms, each one of these terms that is driven by a pole gets multiplied by a residue. What do you think is the effect of the zeros? The effect of the zeros is exactly to decide how big are each one of these uh, of the residues, okay? So essentially, the zeros can decide how, you know, what are the weights of each one of the poles in the total effect, okay? So, um, right, so, uh, you know, right in he here, right? So, um, each pole, right, with the residue Ri, the terms are terms of the input response, the uh, magnitude is bounded by Ri times, um, you know, uh, E sigma I T and oscillates at frequency Wi. You see that Ri does not depend on the pole, depends on the zeros, okay? So how do we compute this Ri? Um, there are many ways, you know, probably if you're taking the Laplace transforms, probably you've seen that, uh, you know, like you've looked at uh, several ways to compute the res residues. One way that I like, which again is nice and graphical and intuitive, is what is called the cover-up method, okay? So the cover-up method, if you want the formula, is given by this. So the, assuming that you have a non-repeated pole Pi, then its residue is given by this limit, okay? So essentially take the limit of S minus Pi times G of S as S goes to Pi. What does it mean in practice? Remember that G of S, if Pi is a pole, G of S at the denominator will have a term that looks like S minus Pi. So when you multiply by S minus Pi, you're essentially removing that particular factor, okay? So remove the factor S minus Pi from the denominator of G, <coughs> and then compute G at that value of Pi, okay? Let's look at how you can actually do it. For example, we have this transfer function here, okay? What I want to do is I want to compute, um, you know, clearly I want to write it as this partial fraction expansion. What is the residue associated with the pole at minus one? Okay, so for the pole at minus one, what I had to do is compute the value of this function, okay, at minus one, neglecting the term, the factor with minus one as a pole, okay? So then in particular, in this case, um, you know, R1 will be given by um, one over, um, minus one plus one plus j, that multiplies minus one plus one minus j, okay? This is algebraically. Graphically, how do you compute it? Well, what will be the magnitude of the transfer function at this point, neglecting the pole that is here? What will be the magnitude of this? Uh, do you have any zeros? No. So it's a one divided, you have poles. What is the distance to this pole? Um, this is one, this is minus one, this is minus one. Um, what is this distance here? Hello, one, <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is this distance here? Again, one, right? So this residue will be one divided by one divided by one which is one, <laughs> okay? Oh, actually, we had to compute the phase, okay? Uh, what is the phase of this vector, the vector from here to here? That's negative 90, okay? What is the phase of this vector from here to here is positive 90, okay? So the net effect of the two is zero. And in fact, you see that what I have is a residue of magnitude one and phase zero plus one. 
Okay, so now what is the residue associated to, um, uh, to this pole here? What I need to compute is, okay, so what is the distance? Uh, there are no zero, so uh, multiply by, by one. Uh, what is the distance to this pole? It's one. What is the distance from here to here? It's two, right? So remember these are poles, so I had to divide. So the magnitude of this residue is one half, okay? What is the phase of this residue? Um, what I had to look is, what is the phase of this vector? From here to here? Sorry? Minus 90 degrees. Remember that this is a pole, so I had to invert it, so this would be 90. What is the phase of this vector? Again, minus 90 degrees, it's a pole, so I had to invert. So I have 90 plus 90, right? So what I get is 180. So now I have something which has a magnitude of one half and has phase 180 degrees. In other words, is negative one half, okay? Do a calculation for the other residue and you get again negative one half. Um, remember, um, so um, because the terms which involve poles are actually divided, right? So I'm actually divided, dividing by S minus the pole, right? S minus the pole has magnitude two, I'm dividing by two, so it's one half. No, no, it's not short distance or long distance. Is you divide by the distances from the pole, so you multiply by the distances from the zeros, and divide by the distances to the poles. Okay, clear? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so what we get is this. This is the you know my response, and these are the relative weight. So. I have one that multiplies the simple exponential, and then I have negative one half that multiplies the, uh, you know, this um, complex conjugate, um, you know, exponentials, okay? So what I get is this would be the simple exponential. This would be my, um, you know, these are the two terms that correspond to the complex conjugate poles. At the end of the day, what you get the yellow line is actually the response, okay? And you see it's the sum of those two, okay? Now, what happens if I add a pole, a, a zero, okay? And in particular, I will add a zero that happens to be near one of the poles, okay? So I put a zero here. Again, let's use the cover up method, okay? So what is the residue of the first pole? Okay, the first, so uh, the, what is the magnitude of the residue? I had to multiply the distance from the zeros, right? What is the distance from this zero to this pole? Is epsilon, right? What is its, uh, uh, what is its phase? Well, um, oh, sorry, okay. So the magnitude would be the distance between the zero and the pole, which is epsilon, divided by the distance uh, from this pole to this pole, which is one, divided by the distance from this pole to this pole, which is again one, okay? Uh, what, so the, we know that the magnitude of the residue will be epsilon. What will be the phase of the residue? The phase of the vector from the zero to the pole is zero. The phase of this vector is negative 90. The phase of this vector is positive 90. So the net phase is zero. And what we get is this residue is actually epsilon. <clears throat> okay, you can do the calculation for the other two residues and what you get is actually this, these numbers here, okay? And what you will see now is that 
<clears throat> in the response, you see that the residue of, of this term is epsilon, which is essentially zero, okay? And in fact, in the response, what you will see is that that exponential has essentially disappeared, right? And the response is almost entirely made of the only the uh, exponential decaying sinusoid, okay? So the first effect that you can think of for zeros is that of reducing the weight, reducing the residue of nearby poles, okay? In particular, what if the zero matches exactly the pole, okay? So if I have S plus one divided over, divided S plus one, what do you think happens? Well, this guy will cancel with this guy. So now I'm left with these two terms, okay? So I used to have a third order system, but now by this pole zero cancellation, I'm left with a second order system. What does it mean? Essentially what has happened is that the residue of this pole now is zero. Okay. You can also see, see this in terms of the modal form, right? So if you remember the modal form, the residue is actually the product of BI and CI. If the residue is zero, meaning that the product of BI and CI is zero, what does that mean? It means that either BI or CI are zero, or both are zero meaning that that particular mode now is either uncontrollable if bi is equal to zero or unobservable if ci is equal to zero or both, okay? Now, if that particular pole, if that particular mode is stable, then fine, okay, yeah, okay. So the, you know, my system is moving in a way that I cannot observe and I cannot influence, but is moving in a way that is not blowing up in my face. On the other hand, if that mode was unstable, now I have an unstable mode that I cannot control and I cannot observe, okay? Which is bad, <laughs> okay? So while there may be a temptation, for example, in placing zeros uh, you know, uh, in your control system in such a way that they cancel poles that, that are troublesome for you, it's okay to do so as long as you are canceling stable poles. Never, ever, don't even dream of canceling unstable poles, okay? Uh, in general, things will not work out. In any case, what you're doing is just hiding your head in the sand and pretending that you're not seeing that your system is about to blow up, okay? So never, ever do that. Mathematically, it can work out okay. Physically, practically, it never does, okay? So just don't do it, okay? So avoid that. Avoid unstable pole zero cancellation. More effects of zeros. Okay, so um, uh, let me take a little bit of a step back. You know, this is actually some transfer function for some special blocks, okay? So let's say that now we have a system we just takes the input and computes its integral, okay? You know that the integrate, integration is a linear operation, so a linear, you know, this is a perfectly valid linear system, okay? So let's do the algebra. If u of t is equal to e to the power st, what is the output? If I'm integrating e to the power st, the output will be one over s times est, right? So what is your transfer function? is one over S, right? The transfer function is what is your output, what multiplies e to the power st in your output, so it's one over S. In fact, you can build a state space model for, um, for something that integrates. The state space model will be just x dot is equal to the, the derivative is equal to the input, and your output is equal to the state. Uh, so these are the, your A, B, C, D matrices. You compute the transfer function that way, what you get is S inverse, that is one over S, okay? So whenever you see one over S, you can think of that as multiplying uh, uh, the transfer function of a system by one over S is the same as putting an integrator in series with that particular system, okay? 
Let's do the opposite. Let's compute the derivative. Okay, so now I have a differentiator that is a system that takes some signal as an input and generates um, uh, the derivative at its, as its output, okay? If the input is e to the power st, what is the derivative is s times e power st, right? So what we know is the transfer function of, ah, sorry, so this is differentiator, sorry. Copy-paste typo. Okay, so the transfer function of a differentiator is s, okay? Again, whenever you take the transfer function of a system multiplied by s, is the same thing as putting that particular system in series with a differentiator. Now, can you construct the state space model that gives me as a transfer function S? Try as hard as you can, you will never be able to find that state space model. Why is that? Because in order for a system to have a state space model, that system must be causal. The derivative, a differentiator, is not a causal system. Why is that? What is the derivative telling me? Right, so I have a certain function, right? And I compute the derivative at this point, right? What is the derivative? The derivative is essentially the tangent at this point, right? So if I have something that gives me the derivative of another signal, this derivative is actually telling me something about what the signal will do in the future, okay? So it is not causal, okay? So something that you should keep in mind is that very often we will write differentiators and uh, you know, we multiply things by S. Keep in mind that a pure differentiator is something that cannot be physically realized, okay? Keep that in mind. It's a nice construction, so definitely you can compute derivatives, but you cannot have a physical system that computes derivative of a signal exactly, okay? Because they're just not a causal operator, okay? We we'll see that we can approximate the derivative, but you cannot compute the derivative exactly. Okay, so now another way of looking at the zero is the following. So let's say that we have a transfer function with a zero. Um, okay, so actually the zero here, I'm sorry, I'm using a different convention, but anyway, so we write it as S plus Z uh, times G tilde of S. So now G tilde is whatever you have in the transfer function that is not that zero term, okay? Now you can write this as uh, just carry out the calculation. This is the same as writing z times g tilde plus s time g tilde, okay? So now you can think of this, the, the time response will be z times the time response of my g tilde system plus the derivative of the time response of that g tilde, okay? So then my time response will be given by z, z times y tilde plus y tilde dot, okay? So every time you, you have a zero, and you notice that this is a zero which is actually in the left uh, half plane, that is a, has a negative real part, okay? Um, that is essentially adding a derivative term to the output. This is something that generally has an anticipatory effect, okay? And you see, so um, this was the, the response that we had before without the zero, and this is with a zero uh, in the left half plane, okay? And what you see is that now I no longer have this response, but I'm adding the derivative of this to the response, right? So what is the derivative? So in this part of the, you know, of the response, the derivative is positive, right? So my actual response will be given by this plus its derivative. And that's why you see that, you know, you have this peak that is much earlier, right? About this point, the two responses, you know, the derivative is zero. So, and in fact, you can check that, um, you know, it's a slightly, for 
t is slightly less than one, the value of this response and the value of this response is about 0 0.2 and is the same, okay? Okay? Um, but essentially what you see is that um, the effect of adding a derivative is that of anticipating the response, okay? Because essentially you're looking into the future of the input in generating the output, okay? So usually these zeros have this like a beneficial effect of speeding up your response, okay? On the other hand, okay, so you can also think of, so this is what happens when you have a zero with a negative real part. What happens with a zero with a positive real part? We know that if we have a pole with a positive real part, means that the system is unstable, okay? If you have a zero with a positive real part, you're not changing the stability. So stability, if the system was stable, the poles are still wherever they are, they're not affected by the location of the zeros, so the system will still be stable, okay? However, one way of interpreting a zero in the right half plane is essentially the same as in you know, when I do this calculation, instead of adding the derivative, I am subtracting the derivative, okay? So, so in a sense, this is the opposite of being anticipatory. <laughs> so I know that my input is going in that direction, so I will go in the opposite direction, okay? Um, so indeed, when you have a nominium phase zero, typically what happens is that the output will tend to move in the wrong direction initially before recovering, okay? In fact, so these are called, you know, uh, zeros with a positive real part are called no minimum phase zeros. And as you can imagine, they're typically bad news for control design, okay? Because you push the system that way, the system will start by going that way, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not typically user friendly, okay? And in fact, you see it here, right? So in the very same system, I put the zero, instead of putting at minus one, I put the zero at positive one, right? So this is the response without any zeros. This was the response with a good zero. You see that, uh, you know, it's kind of like faster response. And the yellow is the response with a bad zero. And you see that it starts going the wrong way right, and then goes the other way, and then eventually goes to zero. Um, so, um, so typically, uh, no minimum phase zeros depend on the choice of the output. Um, uh, so typically, if you want to make your life easier, either choose a different output or maybe move your sensor, okay? Um, what are systems which actually have a no minimum phase behavior? Uh, these are actually um, more common than you may imagine, for example. When you make a turn on, when you're riding a bicycle and you're making a turn, what do you do? You're riding a bicycle and then you just do this, and then you turn, uh -uh. <laughs> what happens if you do that? If you just do that, it will probably fall on the outside, right? So when you're making a turn on a bicycle, what you actually do is, if you want to make a turn to the right, first you do a little bit on the left, and then lean the bike over and turn to the right, okay? So actually bicycles are one of the prime examples of more minimum phase systems, okay? Uh, and there are many others, okay? But next time you, 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 you ride the bicycle, think about this, okay? So think of what will happen if you just riding and you just do this, okay? And actually how you actually do turns. Okay, thanks, see you next time.